is going to be an interesting briefing. Um, I have a few things for all of you at the top. So today the Biden-Harris administration is announcing a set of concrete steps to accelerate investments in our ports, waterways, and freight networks. These goals and timelines will mobilize federal agencies, get money out of the door for high impact projects faster, and lay the foundation for successful implementation of the historic investments included in the bipartisan infrastructure deal for our supply chains, jobs, growth, and competitiveness. This action plan will increase federal flexibilities for port grants, accelerate port infrastructure grant awards, identify project locations for coastal navigation, inland water, waterway, and land ports of entry, and launch the first round of expanded port infrastructure grants. Outdated infrastructure has real cost for families, as we all know, for our economy and for our competitiveness. We're seeing that right now, even as we move record goods through our ports. With supply chain bottlenecks forming that, that lead to higher prices and lower deliveries for American families. Even as we take immediate action, we have a chance to make lasting fixes through the bipartisan infrastructure deal. The bipartisan infrastructure deal includes a total of $17 billion to improve infrastructure at coastal ports, inland ports and waterways, and land ports of entry along the border. This is the single largest federal investment in our ports in U.S. history. And these investments will improve the efficiency, sustainability, and resiliency of these hubs of commerce. As you all know, the President will be visiting the Port of Baltimore tomorrow where he will further discuss the administration's port action plan and the historic investment in ports in the bipartisan infrastructure deal. Today, our Sur U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, released a community tool kit for addressing health misinformation, continuing his administration's work to combat health misinformation during the pandemic and beyond. As you all know, earlier this year, Dr. Murthy released a Surgeon General's advisory warning people about the urgent threat of health misinformation. The toolkit released today builds on his effort, offering practical guidance for trusted community leaders like healthcare professionals, school administrators, teachers, and faith leaders to understand, identify, and stop the spread of misinformation. This is this is particularly timely. Yesterday, Kaiser Family Foundation released its vaccine monitor findings outlining that belief in pandemic-related mis misinformation is widespread, with 78% of adults saying that they have heard at least one of eight different false statements about COVID-19 that they either believe to be true or are unsure if it is true or false. As we continue our effort to vaccinate more Americans, including children, it's mission critical Americans have access to accurate information so they can make health decisions based on facts. Last week, for the fourth time, Republican members of the Senate Small Business Committee blocked a vote and refused to show up to a hearing on Dilawar Syed, a qualified uncontroversial nominee to be the Deputy administra Administrator of the Small Business Administration. This is a position important for helping small businesses across the country and Delaware has had a successful business career and is endorsed by more than 200 groups and individuals, including the Chamber of Commerce. If confirmed, he would also be the highest ranking Muslim in this administration. But Republicans whose justification for opposing his nomination keep shifting as argument after argument falls flat, continue to block a vote on his nomination. If for some reason they don't believe he should be confirmed, they should just say so and vote no. Instead, they are obstructing a vote from even taking place. As the SBA works to help small businesses build back from the devastation caused by this pandemic, we call on these Republican senators to do their job and show up and allow a vote on this qualified nominee. And that's all I have. Go ahead, Alex. Thanks, Karin. Uh, two quick ones on infrastructure and then one on Prop 26. Um, to start, obviously, we're all pretty interested in timing for this bill. And the President said yesterday in his WKRC interview that Americans could see some of the funds go out, quote, literally in a matter of weeks. 
Um, what exactly could we expect to see happen that quickly? And is there a risk that he and other administration actors are overpromising at this point when you know the secretary just mentioned that it could take months for a lot of these programs to go forward? Well, I think I think I, I think there's what you call shovel ready and shovel worthy. These are things that you will hear us talk about um, a lot. And the secretary actually did say there are projects that are shovel ready and ready to go, and that is actually a real thing. Um, one of the things that the president talked about last night, he identified like the Brent the Brent Spence Bridge as a major example of a project he expects to get funding. Right? He uh, the ideal will also help the deal will also help transit expansion projects, including uh, Valley Metro Northwest phase. Uh, two extension in Phoenix, Arizona, and Met Council Gold Line extension in, so in St. Paul, Minnesota. So, you know, we're at, we're going to be working to pinpoint areas of the greatest need uh, where these investments will, will make the big differences in the daily lives of families and create jobs. So we'll have more to share in the near future. But there, you know, there are projects that are ready to go, and we're going to identify that. And we'll have more to share as the days come. And then following up actually on, on Trevor's comments on oversight, you all have talked about how important preventing waste and fraud and abuse are to the president. Um, so can you speak about what specifics the administration is putting in place to prevent that? And how involved with the, will the president be? Is, is he looking at deputizing like a, a similar uh, role to the COVID czar or potentially doing what President Obama did with him? and having the vice president oversee implementation or any of those things on the Yeah, table. those are all great questions. Um, as soon as, you know, we sign the bill, <laughs> which yeah, I know you're asking me at ti uh, about timing, uh, which will happen soon. As the president said on Saturday, he wants to make sure that the people who worked very hard on both sides of the aisle are there uh, to, for the bill signing. So as soon as we get that done, uh, we'll, we will share more. We'll share more about the implementation. And you're right, we want to make sure uh, there is accountability. That is something that's going to be incredibly critical and important important to the administration. And as you can imagine, this is something that's so important to the president. Uh, and so he'll you know, be getting regular updates as we move forward and be uh, very engaged on this. And then on COP26, how involved is the president um, sort of remaining in these talks if they go forward? And is he optimistic there will ultimately be a deal? Well, I'll say this. The president is definitely very engaged. We have White House officials who are there uh, currently at COP26. The, uh, 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 Secretary Pete Buttigieg, that's where he basically left after leaving here, speaking with all of you. Uh, and so, again, we're very engaged. We have White House uh, official staffers there as well who've been in and out of, of COP26. So, uh, yeah, we're just going to continue to have those conversations, and we are optimistic. I know that the president's not going to sign the bill until next week, likely, when members of Congress can join him. But why is there not a more urgent effort to have him and um, members of his staff and cabinet out on the road selling and explaining the various components of the infrastructure bill and build that better? Well, I, I'll say this. The president is doing local media, as we, as Alex was just asking me about Cincinnati. Um, and that is a way that's really important for, for to hear the president's voice to talking directly uh, to the American people. We'll see more of that. The president's going to be going to Baltimore uh, tomorrow. And we'll continue to see uh, the secretaries uh, that we had, who we've listed, uh, who are going to be out there uh, really selling uh, selling this bill, as you say. Um, but let me just add a few things. Um, so it's going to be uh, the, sec the cabinet is Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg, Transportation, Energy, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, who was just here clearly, uh, Interior Secretary Deb Holland, and EPA Secretary Michael Regan, who's actually at COP26 right now, um, as well as cabinet members and administration officials who will play a major role in implementing this agenda. And we'll, you'll see them out there uh, over the next coming days and continue. I mean, those, that's one of the reasons we had Secretary Buttigieg here. That's one of the reasons we had Secretary Raimondo, because you all are writing about this, and people are watching, and we want to make sure that they hear directly from us. Understood, and yeah. I know that there is going to be an effort to get people out into the various yeah. communities across the country, but you do have uh, some of your fellow Democrats who say, we want the president to be more vocal. We want him to be out there and explaining this and explaining the various components, because you are talking about yeah. these big pieces of legislation, and you still have the second piece of it, which hasn't we're passed working very yet. very hard on, and we're very optimistic, as the Is president says. Though, to not I mean, have him I, and, and, 
and other top officials out in a more robust way right but, now. But the president is out tomorrow. He's going to be in Baltimore. He's going to be talking about this. Yeah, and he'll continue to do more. And I would, I would actually argue that he has been out there. Any time that, you know, I've traveled with him, many of you have, have been part of the pool where he talks about both the infrastructure bill and he's talked about the Build Back Better Act. Uh, and he's been into multiple states uh, doing that over the past several months. Look, that's going to continue. Uh, I think what he wants to make sure is that get this signed, uh, having all the parties, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side, who were very, very instrumental in getting this done. And then we'll continue, you know, we'll continue making sure that we're selling this, talking to the American people. And you're right, this is a complex piece of administration, a uh, piece of uh, administration, piece of legislation. But they're also very popular. We know right, that the American public wants infrastructure. They, it is in, very popular. They want to see the modernization of that hit hard infrastructure. So we're going to continue to push forward. And one more, if I could, and, and Secretary sorry. Raimondo was, was asked about this, but I'm curious for your take. Some of what was announced today and what Secretary Raimondo was talking about is an effort to create jobs as well. But you are dealing with worker shortages right now. So uh, how do you deal with the worker shortages, given your ultimate goal? Yeah, so um, are you talking about the part, the port action, uh, action plan that we, okay. So let me, I just want to say a couple of things uh, about that. Um, so, uh, and, and what it's going to do in the short term, which is critical and important. So, you know, while, while we're moving record amounts of goods through our ports and to shelves, we understand the frustration that Americans feel when backlogs uh, lead to higher prices or delayed goods. So today's announcement builds on the steps we've already taken to help address the supply chain uh, challenges we've seen globally because of that pandemic. So just wanted to make sure that was clear. And that is part, that is kind of part of uh, what the president has already done, which is partnering with uh, partnering with the ports of LA, Long Beach, along with leading re retailers and shippers like FedEx and UPS to move goods in and out of those ports 24-7. So within weeks, the port of Savannah, the third bus busiest port in the country, will have five pop-up sites in Georgia and North Carolina that will help ease uh, congestion on uh, the shipyard. So within 45 days, we'll be launching uh, $240 million in grants to to improve ports and in the weeks and months that follow billions of dollars additional money will be flowing to improve our critical port infrastructure and bolstering this work is historic levels of, of investment we've secured through the bipartisan infrastructure deal which includes as I mentioned 17 billion dollars for ports and tens of billions of dollars more for roads bridges rail and other links in the supply chain combined these steps are going to create good paying jobs fix our supply chains to generate to, to, to come and lower uh, prices for working families. And so that's a really important, the good paying jobs. Uh, when we talk about, you know, that, that uh, the labor shortage, that's, I think the president has talked about this, the importance of making sure that we're paying people uh, a, a wages that, that, uh, uh, that are competitive so that they're able to, you know, to come back into the workforce. So that's an, an, uh, mission critical there as well. Thank you, Corrine. Um, during that interview yesterday with the Cincinnati TV station, the president apologized for being late. Mm -hmm. He said it was due to little foreign policy issues. What was he referring to? So as you can imagine, uh, you know, we're not going to read into, uh, you know, every every aspect of the president's day. He meets regularly with his National Security Council and advisors. Uh, some meetings go, you know, go right on time and some meetings go a little longer. But I'm not going to read uh, anything uh, specific to that or I don't have anything to share on that. Okay. Yeah. And do, um, do you expect him to be doing more of these local TV interviews as part of his sales pitch for infrastructure? Yes, we, we do. I don't have anything to, to preview. The one, in, the one that he did last night with Cincinnati was the first, uh, but we're hoping to get him out there more as we've been talking about so the American people can hear it directly from the President of the United States. Can you just one more yeah. on um, the funding for infrastructure and I apologize because maybe it is just me no, but um, I still don't really understand how all the money is going to be allocated. For the broadband piece mm -hmm. the Secretary made very clear states are going to get a finite amount of money, mm -hmm. they'll distribute it, the rest will be allocated based on need. For all the rest of the money, how will it be distributed? Does it go to states first? And will the federal government determine what projects that they will be assigned to? So 
I don't have the specifics for you right now, but I can tell you the agencies that will be involved um, in on the specific components, right? So Department of Transportation on how this will improve our, we'll, we'll be in charge of how this improve our ports, rails, bridges, and our supply chain, right? That's, that's kind of obvious there. The Department of Interior is going to be on strengthening the climate resilience and the impact of Native communities. Uh, we have the Department of Energy, which gonna, it's going to be focusing on repairing our electric grid. Uh, Department of Commerce on getting high-speed internet to every American, as we just heard from the sec Secretary herself. You have the Environmental Protection Agency, and they're going to be replacing uh, uh, lead pipes and addressing pollution. So those are kind of how it's going to be break broken down into agencies. The specifics on that uh, I don't have to share with you today, but I promise we are – the Secretary talked about this just now, which is transparency is going to be key here. Uh, and so we're going to make sure that the American public and all of you know how we're going to move forward on implementing this. Thank you. Thanks, Karina. As the President promotes uh, this infrastructure bill, uh, we know that Leader Schumer uh, wanted a vote in the Senate on the much larger social <laughs> spending bill by Thanksgiving. That's what he's hoping for. Are there any details you can provide about any outreach the President will be doing to Democrats this week? I know they're away and out of town uh, on recess, but any outreach that he's doing to those key moderates like Senator Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema? Yeah, so I don't have anything to read out for you today on any calls that he's made or any scheduled um, meetings or anything in that nature. But as you can imagine, the White House, uh, uh, White House officials, my colleagues, are constantly in contact with members and also staff. Um, and um, as you know, last Friday they voted on a rule uh, in the House uh, to make sure that the Build Back Better Act was voted on uh, the, the week of November 15th. So we're, as the President said himself yesterday and in the, the last couple of days, he's very optimistic uh, on making, on getting that done. And we'll continue to talk to Leader Sch Schumer. We'll continue to have those conversations on the Senate side as well uh, to make sure that we this gets delivered. Do you see that as a feasible timeline with moderates waiting to see more information from the CBO? I mean, he sees this as an urgency, right? And and we've said we've said this before. Like members understand how important it is to get this out, uh, to get this done. Uh, we got the bipartisan infrastructure deal, this once in a generation uh, investment, uh, very historic. And now we're going to make sure that we get the Build Back Better and Act done. Just really quickly on COVID, uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is vowing to fight against the president's vaccine mandate for private businesses. He outlined today a few bills that he would like, which would include opt outs. Uh, for that vaccine mandate, and he said, quote, we need to stop bossing people around. Does the White House any, have any response to this, and is there any concern that this could move a state like Florida in the wrong direction? So, you know, I'll, I'll say this, you know, as, as I said yesterday, DOJ will be defending these kind of in, in the, uh, these lawsuits, these individual lawsuits. You know, we're confident in our authority to protect American workers as this, this virus is killing uh, 1,100, about approximately 1,100 Americans a day. This is an obligation uh, that the Department of Labor has to protect workers face grave danger and it's and it's derived from a law passed by Congress that's been around for more than 50 50 years so this is an authority that the Secretary of Department of Labor has uh, this is when you talk when you think about grave danger when you think about 1100 people uh, dying a, a day that is uh, that is that is I think you know an authority that he can use to make sure that people feel safe um, in their workplace and that they don't get sick so so, you know, what we continue to advocate uh, advocate with from here is to push businesses to move forward uh, with their policies now. These are policies that are protecting workforces and avoiding disruptions related to employees getting sick with COVID, as I just mentioned, expanding the workforce, and saving lives. That's the business that we're in. That's why we put together, this president put, moved forward with, uh, with this comprehensive uh, vaccination effort very early on uh, in his administration. Uh, to make sure that we get to a place that we can get out of this pandemic. And, you know, the question is really that I have is why are these legislators, these Republicans, getting in the way of that, getting in the way of saving lives, getting in the way of us making sure that the economy is working as well uh, and getting out of this pandemic? And so that's the question for them. Go ahead. Uh, so after um, Congress has passed the infrastructure bill, how much can American, the American people expect that inflation will be reduced as a result of that over the next 12 months, say? 
Yeah, I, I don't have a specific number for you. I'm happy to, to you know, to talk to our economics team and get something more uh, granular there. Uh, but as we've heard from experts, uh, whether it is an economist expert or the 17 uh, Nobel laureate um, uh, economists have said that it, this bill, the Build Back Better Act and uh, bipartisan infrastructure will ease inf inflation. Uh, so that's really important. That's something that we, you know, when we talk to, when we, when we hear members are are afraid of going big, we say, well, this is going to actually help us in the long run, especially as we see uh, with prices going up, we see the inflation uh, continuing to be out there. Um, and so that is really an important message that we have. I don't have, like I said, a granular number for you, but we know this from economists who have said that these two bills will help do that. Another topic, uh, election integrity. A couple of my colleagues uh, wrote a piece uh, documenting nearly a dozen cases where people have violently uh, intimidated or threatened um, U.S. election officials. Um, there was one example where a man told election officials in Vermont that he would put a pistol in their mouths and, and pull the trigger. None of these cases that we documented, um, in none of them were um, any of the people arrested, charged, or prosecuted. Um, it, it, are we living in a country where there's uh, impunity around these kinds of issues, and, and, and what level of confidence do you have in the Department of Justice to, to actually police these issues? Well, I, we have all the confidence in the Department of Justice um, on these particular issues. I clearly, I can't speak to them here, uh, so I would refer you to the Department of Justice on any, any specifics there, but we have complete confidence in the Department of Justice. Okay. Thanks so much. Yesterday, some Senate Democrats sent the President a letter on high ga gas prices and how to combat those, including suggesting banning crude oil exports. Is President Biden considering banning those oil export exports? Which o the oil exports from? The Senate Democrats wrote a letter asking the President to ban crude oil. Okay, got it. The crude, got it. Um, so the administration is closely. Um, it, is closely and directly monitoring the situation. As we've said before, we've communicated with FTC, right, to crack down on illegal pricing and are engaging with countries and entities around the the uh, the OPE, uh, OPEC plus on increasing supply. We're looking at all the tools in our arsenal. We're very concerned about the impact of high energy prices on consumers, especially as we enter the colder months. And so we're continuing, like I said, to monitor uh, the situation and we're going to do everything that we can from here uh, to address. So is that something that President Biden is considering? I, I can't, I don't have anything specific for you. I can just tell you what we've been doing here. Uh, which is uh, call, calling on OPEC uh, to increase their, their supply. We've been uh, looking at, uh, you know, the monitoring the situation. I mean, one of the reasons why the president said no to paying for a bipartisan infrastructure bill with a gas tax is because of this. Uh, and so we're going to continue to just keep an eye on this. And like I said, we're going to, you know, we have tools in our tool belts that we can potentially address this with. So the only other tool that we've heard mentioned, though, from the administration is maybe tapping the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We haven't really heard anything else specific that the president is considering. Does that is that because he feels that his hands are tied when it comes to what he can actually do to try to combat high gas prices? No, I wouldn't read the, read it that way. We just don't have anything right now to to announce. But like I said, we're monitoring this and uh, we're 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 working through what is it that how we can actually address this. And one logistical question, is there a summit happening next week between the United States, Mexico, and Canada here at the White House? I don't have any information on that. I'm happy to, to check with the National Security Council. Okay, thank yeah, you. No problem. With respect to the um, Line 5 pipeline replacement, mm -hmm. is one of the possible outcomes from whatever happens after this study uh, reduced output? So let me, I, I, I'm going to use this opportunity to, do, to have some clarification here. Um, so I think there was some confusion yesterday about the Line 5, so I just want to, to clarify again. So Peter's question yesterday was about the current Line 5, your colleague. And on the current pipeline, as you know, the state of Michigan is objecting to the continued use of its easement for the current pipeline. Additionally, Canada has decided to invoke 
the dispute resolution provision of the 1977 Transit Pipelines Treaty on the current pipeline. We expect that both the U.S. and Canada will engage constructively in those negotiations. Canada is a close ally and a key partner in, our, in energy trade, as, as well as efforts to address the climate crisis and protect the environment. These negotiations and discussions between the two countries shouldn't be viewed as anything more than that than that and certainly not an indicator that the U.S. government is considering shutdown. That is something that we're not going to do. As it relates to the current pipeline, in addition to those negotiations, the current pipeline is subject to litigation between en Enbridge and the state of Michigan, and those parties can speak more to the process. So what I, what I think confused some, some folks uh, here is that there are, there, there are as a result, uh, uh, a con con consent decree uh, as a result, there is a suggested potential replacement for a portion of Line 5. The Army Corps of Engineers announced an environmental impact study of that potential replacement in June, which is what I was talking about yesterday, and that's the study I mentioned. And so that was announced uh, in June and is about the potential replacement, not the current line, uh, which is what Peter had asked yesterday. So again, nothing new to share on the current line. We expect the U.S. and Canada to engage uh, constructively on it, I, do, I don't have anything else to share about that. The current pipeline needs to be replaced and that there is this study ongoing. Um, would a possible outcome from that study be um, you know, a choice that, that limits output? And also, what's the timeline for that study? I have seen some reporting mm -hmm. that a decision could come after the reconciliation vote, and that could be as soon as next week. I don't have a timeline on the study. Uh, again, this is the Army Corps of Engineers who are, who are taking this under. I, I don't have anything more to share. And I want to ask you about another story that's just breaking yep. from our Justice Department reporter. Um, two sources are telling Fox that National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is the foreign policy advisor mentioned in the former Clinton lawyer Michael Sussman's indictment. Uh, I understand that this just came across yeah. while you're at the podium, yeah. so you haven't probably had a chance to read into that, but what is the White House comment on that, and is there any conflict here, given that there has been news around the uh, indictment, uh, is there any conflict here that would preclude Sullivan from being able to carry out his duties? I, I, as you just said, Jackie, I'm just now hearing this, so I, I don't have a, a comment for you at this moment. I don't know anything about what you're, you're just mentioning, so I have to, to talk to our team. Yeah. And there has been news around the dossier, though, over the last couple of weeks, um, and sort of this feeling that it's falling apart after the revelations that the Clinton tied lawyer had lied to the FBI. Um, now, knowing what we know about the dossier, is there any concern that there was a lot of focus or too much focus on that? Uh, during the president's campaign. So, Jackie, I refer you to the Department of Justice. I'm not going to comment on that from here, from the podium. Go ahead. Thanks, Green. Um, what kind of outreach has the White House done uh, specifically to the six House progressives who voted against the infrastructure deal? I don't have any outreach to speak to at this moment. As as I've said many times before, we are in constant communication with members on the Hill, uh, but I don't have anything uh, to, to share at this moment that's specific. Uh, and also, uh, a Republican member of uh, Congress today shared a video on Twitter in which he appeared to attack, um, uh, to be shown attacking Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and the President. Um, Twitter's put a disclaimer on his tweet now. Uh, does the White House have a position on how social media uh, companies should be um, should be moderating this type of uh, content? So I'll say this: um, you know, there is absolutely no place uh, for for. Um, of any kind of any no place for any violence of any sort uh, in this political system, and uh, you know I I, I don't want to go any further than that. Uh, I leave it to uh, the social media platform on how they're going to move forward on that. But l there is no place for that for any type of violence or that type of language in the political system, and it should not be happening. And we should be condemning it. Thanks, Kareen. A uh, question on another topic, but first on infrastructure. Obviously, the administration has had months as we are watching. We were watching this bill go through the process of going, making its way through Congress. Why don't we have a concrete list of projects that will be pursued first, and why don't we have a clear timeline on when those will, will be implemented? We'll have something soon. 
I mean, this is something that uh, clearly, as you said, we've been working on uh, for a long time. And there was a process, right? There was a legislative process uh, that, that was happening. And uh, and now we're in a place where we're going to sign, the president's going to sign this legislation soon into law. And once that is done, we will have, we will lay out our plan. We will be transparent. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're bringing the secretaries here for the different components of the bill, to talk to all of you, to take your questions on how they're, how they're thinking about this, how they're going to be implementing this uh, to the American public, and we'll have more. We'll, we'll have more to share. And then we were told much earlier this year that the president would be getting his annual physical later this year. It's obviously later this year. The year is almost yeah. up. So when will he be getting that physical, and we, will we get the full results? I was just thinking, you're right, it is later this year. It's November. Um, I don't have <laughs> the year is flying by. Um, I, I don't have anything for you. Uh, as Jen has said and we have said, that is going to happen, and once it does, we, we will be transparent about it. will for sure be done before the end of the year. I, that's, I, I think that's what we have said in the past. We will get this done. We'll, we'll make sure to get this done and share it with you, all of you when it gets done, when it happens. Yeah, Tim. Uh, I have a seasonal question that I apologize for in advance, but will the president be pardoning turkeys this year? Oh, wow. <laughs> a lot of people have asked me. I'm now asking you. I, I mean, it is, a, it is a regular tradition, so I'm assuming that will be happening. I don't have any news or any uh, schedule uh, to, to share with you on that particular uh, pardoning of the turkey event, uh, but uh, I'm sure that we'll have something soon. Okay, but thank you more, for thank you for the question. Uh, very serious, but actually, on a more serious yep. note, um, parents will be getting their second to last child tax credit payment, expanded tax credit payment, um, later this month. What message does the White House have for them? Uh, many yeah. families have come to count on this. Um, it's obviously part of BBB, but there's no, there are no guarantees, and this is, this is sort of a cliff that's hanging out there. No, that's a very good question because that child tax credit has, um, has really benefited uh, families, uh, giving families that, that tax cut, that middle, middle class tax cut that's so critical. It's cut poverty by 50 percent, uh, childhood um, poverty. Uh, Children poverty uh, by uh, 50 percent. So it's been it's been incredibly important. But this is why the president is going to continue to fight for the Build Back Better plan. This is why he's going to continue to talk to uh, members on on the Hill to to make sure that this has happened. But he is optimistic. We talked about this rule that was voted on on uh, yeah. for last Friday for November 15th uh, to make sure that the Build Back Better Act is uh, voted on in the House that week. And so he's very optimistic. But you're right. This this Build Back Better Act is about it's pro families, right? It's pro people, and it gives people that breathing room that they so need, um, that they haven't had in many, many years. That there, we haven't seen that investment in people. So the president's going to continue to work for the child tax credit. He's going to continue to to fight for the paid leave. All of the things that are in this in this bill. We think about child care, elder care, uh, making sure that uh, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, making sure that uh, prescription drugs are affordable. Not taking a huge chunk uh, out of your uh, out of your paycheck, so all of these things. That's part of the Build Back Better Act. He's going to continue to fight for it, and that's the message. Um, and there's a reason, right, that he put it, he put the child tax credit in the American Rescue Plan, another historical uh, piece of legislation, because he was trying to meet the moment uh, of what the American family was going through during this pandemic. Totally have to wrap. Oh, okay. I'll, t I'll take I'll take one, one last question. Um, uh, two quick questions. Um, as of yesterday morning, the president said he hasn't spoken to the governor elect of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin. Um, has he tried calling him again? I, I don't. I would. <laughs> I don't have anything. I don't have anything more to read out from what we have. What I said at the podium last week. I don't have anything more. And also, obviously, when a president goes on something like a sales tour of his infrastructure plan, where he goes matters and sends a message. So can you talk about why specifically the port of Baltimore was picked versus a lot of the other ports like Savannah yeah. or Los Angeles? So he'll speak to that tomorrow. So I don't want to get ahead of the president. Uh, but he'll, have, uh, he'll lay that out for all of you as to why he's there. Um, but as you can imagine, it's very important to the supply chain and all the work that he's doing uh, to make sure uh, that uh, we deal with uh, the issue that we're having currently. Do you have an update on Ethiopia? That's all I have for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I called on the I called on the back. We we had Ramondo take pictures from questions from the back guys.